we have a whole bunch of VIPs in the room, um, so many that I'm, I'm going to actually keep this brief. So Member of Parliament, Chris Lewis. Stand up, Chris. <laughs> Member of Parliament, Leanne Rood. <laughs> and Member of Parliament, Karen Vecchio. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to the Stick to Your Guns dinner and helping the CSSA celebrate its 63rd year in existence. Yep, thank you. I, I'm going to ask Ms. Rude to come up, or I'm sorry, Ms. Vecchio to come up. This is her writing, you're her guest, and uh, I'd like you to, uh, to give her a big welcome. Thanks very much. And Tony, thank you for being the same size as me. It means I'm not playing around with this. So thank you. I really appreciate it. But it's absolutely wonderful to be with all of you here today. And, and welcome to the City of London. I am the Member of Parliament for Elgin Middlesex London. So although I don't have downtown London, I do have great portions of it. But today I'm here to introduce my really good friend who is doing one incredible job for every person in this room. Uh, today, we have the incredible member from Caledon St. Paul. You may know her from the House of Commons where she was asked to leave because just a few months ago, she let the Liberals know that they were lying. That's something we're not allowed to do in the House of Commons, but we have a public safety shadow minister who will hold everybody to account. And if you want to know who studies so hard, it is this very, very member. So elected in 2019, Raquel Dancho has come to the House of Commons and she's done one heck of a job. She has had this role and she is holding she is holding the Liberals to account each and every day. So introducing to you my friend and one of the classiest ladies you'll find up there, even when she's telling those darn Liberals to stop lying, I would like to welcome to us Member of Parliament Raquel Dancho. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I thank you for making me feel so welcome. This has been such a wonderful night. And I think I speak for all my politician friends. We go to a lot of these kind of banquet dinners, but this is food I actually would come back to eat. So thank you, Tony, for spending the money on some really great food tonight, because we really liked it. So yes, the, my name is Raquel Dancho. I'm the Shadow Minister for Public Safety and the Vice Chair of the Public Safety and National Security Committee of Canada, and I am very honoured to be joined by my wonderful colleagues from the House of Commons and also former members of Parliament as well. Let me tell you folks, you have a lot of really hard-working Conservatives uh, working hard every day to protect your rights to own firearms in this country. We are relentless and, as you know, the only party in this country who is able to fight and actually make some change for this. And uh, if it, with any luck, we'll have Pierre Polyev as our next Prime Minister very soon and bring in some much-needed change. Yeah, and I appreciate, Karen, that you mentioned uh, how I got kicked out. You know, it's interesting. The Liberals can lie in the House of Commons, but you can't call them liars. It's such an odd thing that I learned. But also, uh, at the same time, I think it was the proudest moment of my dad's life when I got kicked out for uh, calling them out for lying. So there you go. That's how it goes sometimes. It was, uh, it was a great day. So I, I would like to thank the CSSA for inviting me tonight. It's just wonderful to be in the presence of responsible, knowledgeable, folks who really know what you're talking about, very level-headed, and it's been such a wealth of knowledge, Tony. You're really under great leadership here to everyone in the CSSA under Tony's leadership. We are very grateful. I'm very grateful to know you, what I've learned from you, Tony, and you're always there, phone call away when I have some technical questions. I do own firearms, but I think, Tony, you're a gun expert like no other, so I really appreciate your insight very much. And uh, I really appreciated going to the MP Range Day last year. I, uh, I know a number of my colleagues were there as well. I, it's the first time I ever shot a 44 Magnum. And that gun is like a cannon. I think my ears are still ringing. Someone mentioned that you could take out a moose with that, uh, with that handgun, and I believe them. So it was quite the day. And I'm actually missing out on my own family's range day today. We have a... Uh, we shoot a lot of firearms at my family's farming property, so they're out ATVing and having a good old time in rural Manitoba today. But I'm very happy to be uh, to be joined by all of you. This is a this is a great night for me. 
And uh, I did want to say as well that I'm going to talk a little bit about C21, how we got here. But also I wanted to talk to you about the really serious issues we're facing in this country crime-wise and why it's so frustrating that we have a liberal government who there's a terrible crime headline and they say, oh yeah, well, we're fixing that by going after guns. Well, the people in this room know how effect ineffective that's going to be. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because it's so important that we get a conservative government in, not just to protect firearm ownership rights, but also to ensure that all of our children, all of our wives, our husbands are safe when they walk down the street, which used to be a given in Canada until the liberals came in and brought in their catch and release bail policies. And now we're seeing headlines every day of stabbings and shootings and criminals who, sh who we know should not get anywhere near a firearm, but under Justin Trudeau, they're getting one in under two hours in cities like Toronto. Meanwhile, all the people in this room are following every possible rule, every curveball that Trudeau throws at them, and yet he's punishing the people in this room when he should be going after criminals. So I did want to talk to you a little bit about the work we're doing there as well. So as you um, you may know a little bit about me, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself of how I kind of got into this, uh, this role of talking about guns every day. So I grew up to four generations of Canadian farmers in rural Manitoba, and uh, I learned to shoot guns at a pretty young age. My dad got us at my first gun, I think it was about 12, 10 years old. And uh, we started, I think we went hunting squirrels of all things. But, you know, it's good target practice. And then uh, we went on to deer and other things from there. And it was just something that you do in rural Canada to sustain yourselves. I mean, uh, my, my grandparents and their grandparents who came to Canada for freedom and opportunity, you know, sometimes there wasn't as much government welfare back then. So they would hunt to sustain themselves. And almost everyone in rural Canada has a firearm. It's very normal to have a firearm. In fact, a common 18-year-old birthday present is getting your first gun. That's what it was like when I was growing up. So that's how I felt. It was just everyone owns a firearm. But then I went to university. I went out east, or I guess we're out east now. I came out to Montreal, and uh, I met people who didn't believe in my right to own a firearm. And I met people who... Remember, I'll never forget the day I got into this argument with this other young lady from Toronto. God bless her. But uh, she's like, I can't believe you hunt. It's terrible. And I said, well, you're not a vegetarian. So where is it that you get your meat from? She's like, um, the grocery store. I'm like, oh, okay. So you think it comes packaged in a vacuum seal package in the back of Safeway. Okay. We're not going to find any common ground here. But it was there that I really found I had to start defending myself and my family's way of life. And again, I'm from a generation of farmers that helped build Western Canada. And yet I was surrounded by people who didn't respect or appreciate our way of life. And now my family's just now getting into sports shooting, but we've been hunters and gun owners for many, many, many generations. So when I got this file public safety about a year and a half ago, and the firearms files in that, I felt like I can do this. I've been fighting against lefties at university for about 15 years now. So what's a bunch of liberals? Not very much different. So it, uh, it's been going well so far. And we have found that we've been able to win the argument. And it's really because of the folks that have come before me that I've been able to really defeat the liberals on some major legislation that they've brought forward, or at least cause them to retreat, which is really nice. Because in 2015, 2019 and 2021, they, they ran on misinformation about firearms and helped them win votes. But I think from the hardworking conservatives here at the table with you today, we've been able to turn that around and turn this into a major winning argument for us. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but I did want to acknowledge a former member of parliament in the room, Gary uh, Bright, Breitkreitz. Did I get your last name right? Yeah. All right. So... <laughs> Gary, Gary was one of the first to fight, uh, really, really uh, paved the way for folks like me uh, against the long gun registry all those years ago. You did an incredible job, Gary. I, I heard about you uh, from Candace Bergen, who sort of carried the torch as well. And I don't know what it is about rural Canadians, but we sure, uh, when you get us going on firearms, nothing can stop us. So I had, uh, a very commendable work there. And of course, Candace Bergen, who I got to work with in Parliament for a number of years, she recently uh, moved on from Ottawa but she also did an admirable job on uh, the long gun registry. So we're both the rural Manitoba girls. Must be something in the water, but don't mess with us, you know? And so when we know when they brought in the long gun registry, uh, they said it was going to cost $20 million. <laughs> what a joke. And so it ended up costing $2 billion minimum, Tony, right? It was $2 billion. And so they're saying that the latest so-called buyback, again, I hate to call it that since they never owned it in the first place, so we'll call it a confiscation regime. 
the latest confiscation regime, they're saying, oh, maybe 600,000. So if they underestimated the long gun registry from 20 million to 2 billion, how much is their latest confiscation regime going to cost taxpayers? And how much of an impact is it going to have actually on public safety? Well, it turns out the data shows, as the people in this room know, that the gun control the liberals are trying to bring in so desperately and use as a political football to beat law-abiding citizens with to win votes in Toronto, uh, we know that there is no evidence to back up their claims that it's going to make any impact whatsoever. And in fact, the only things in the gun control realm, and it's hard to even call them gun control, it's just responsible gun ownership, that make any impact on public safety are licensing, background checks, and safe storage, which everyone in this room does with their eyes closed, and something the Conservative Party supports. But anything beyond that, there is no evidence anywhere, no reputable evidence, no peer-reviewed evidence that shows that any amount of gun confiscation has any impact on public safety. So for the party who constantly, you know, shoves down our throats, so follow the science, to say that this is going to make an impact on public safety when all evidence to the contrary says that that's not true, it's so frustrating. How do you talk to someone who's lying to your face, who's lying to Canadians every single day? And we have some incredible researchers in Canada. Dr. Kaylin Langman is one of the latest whose research is some of the most uh, respected research in the country who has shown that none of this is going to make an impact. Didn't make an impact in Australia. Didn't make an impact in the UK. And yet those are the countries that Trudeau is looking to model. So it's very frustrating in that regard. And we try to fight this with facts and the Liberals don't care. They make up lines as we know. And a few years ago, you'll remember this very well. It was first, it was the OIC. Right under the cloak of darkness, the worst pandemic in a century hits. A month later, they come with the largest long gun ban in Canadian history at that point. And they really, it was disgusting at the time. They leveraged the deaths of 22 people, including a pregnant woman, leveraged that for their own selfish political ambition. I just, I can't believe that they did that in the past. In the last summer, um, the conservative colleagues and I heavily litigated that and, cro and really cross-examined, so to speak, the former RCMP commissioner, who's no longer in that role, uh, for her involvement to further the liberal political agenda. And it was really disgusting what they did, but that's where it started. Well, we know C-71 before that. And just a side note on C-71, did you know it was the largest petition in Canadian history fighting C-71? Over, I believe it was 160, 170,000 people who signed that petition, most in history by far, and still the Liberals wouldn't listen. So they say they consult, but we know that that's complete baloney. And then just a few, uh, about eight, two years ago, they introduced the first round of C21, and then of course there was an election. And then uh, last June, they introduced this version of C21. And their claim was, well, who needs a handgun? Just discounting all of the Olympians, the sport shooters, all the pride that handgun sport shooting has brought to Canadians over the years. So much history and pride that conservatives have in our sport shooters. And not to mention all of the ranges that support local police. Uh, my range in my riding supports the RCMP of Manitoba. That's where they train. What do you think is going to happen? Where are the RCMP going to train when that gun range closes because of the pummeling that they're getting from the Liberals. Again, these are things that the Liberals don't respect, that they don't care about, that we're fighting for every day in Parliament. So they brought that forward with no respect to our Olympic sports shooters. Actually, we had Linda Keiko, an incredible sports shooter, represent Canada on the world stage on a number of occasions, come and speak at the committee. And you should watch, if you haven't seen it, watch her school, the Liberal lead on public safety committee. It's quite something. I highly recommend. Have a drink. Watch it. It's pretty impressive. She's an amazing woman. And then, um, so that came forward, and I just want to mention on C21, the Liberals sell this as a handgun freeze, right? We know it's a long-term ban. When uh, it's, it's formally in place by regulation, they jumped the gun, so to speak. They, we were being too effective at committee, taking too long with C21, so uh, the Liberals being sneaky put it in through regulation, which in my opinion is extremely undemocratic, given that this is private property that we're talking about. So they did that. And they say, well, C21, Minister Mendicino says it's the most important piece of gun legislation in history, but let's break that down for you for a minute. So he says that the mandatory maximum for gun smuggling is going to be increased on C21. Well, sounds pretty good, right? Great. People who gun smuggle are part of the major problem with gun violence in Canada. 
Toronto police, in fact, say that nine out of 10 handguns used in crime are smuggled in from the U.S. So it's not from the law-abiding citizens. We know this. And it's also police who are saying this. So he, so it sounds great, great crackdown on gun smokers. But the reality is, he says, oh, we're going to up it to 14 years. Look at us, liberals being so tough on crime. We did an information request, and we found that the prime minister and the prime minister's government since 2015, they've never once used the current maximum of 10 years for gun smuggling and gun trafficking. Not one time. So for him to parade around and saying he's getting tough on crime and gun smuggling, and this is going to be the ticket to success... It's total baloney. So I wanted to make sure you knew that when you're in your discussions with your friends. And then also the red flag laws. So they sold this as something that's really important for battered and abused women, something that everyone, you know, of course, that sounds very good. But then when we actually got expert testimony at committee, indigenous groups, women's legal groups, women's abused women's groups, all oppose it. All of them, the people that this is supposed to help say, this goes too far. One says it puts the onus too much on women which is the very people it's supposed to protect. And the other indigenous groups would say that those who may not like our, our First Nations people too much can just call in and use this against us, which is, of course, a concern that we would all have. Anyone who has a vendetta against you, to put in red flag laws like this makes it that much easier for people to use that against you. So to hear First Nations, uh, multiple chiefs come out and say that I thought was pretty impressive, and I appreciated their leadership on that. So we know that those aren't any good. People who want them don't, or that they're made for don't want them. So that's out. So what's left in this bill? They've already done the handgun freeze. So why do they need it? Well, there's not a lot in there. So we asked the Minister of Public Safety the other day, what are you doing wasting our time at public safety? There are serious, serious crime issues going on in this country. Under your leadership, this is happening, I told him. So why don't you just pull this bill and let us get back to work. And of course, he didn't like that too much, but uh, we're going to keep trying. And then I do want to talk to you about, of course, the C21 amendments that my conservative colleagues and I have fought tooth and nail since the liberals dropped them in the most sneaky and underhanded and undemocratic way I've ever seen. So for those of you that are familiar with legislation, you know, it gets introduced in the House of Commons, it gets debated and debated and debated, and then it goes to committee. And then a committee we call experts, like many folks in this room, Tony Bernardo was there with his expert testimony. We consult, we get information, and then it goes on to the next phase, which is to bring forward amendments. But by then, you know, you're going to keep everything from kind of in the scope of the bill, right? And the scope of this bill was a handgun freeze and some mandatory maximum changes. And then they dropped, in a very sneaky way, they dropped the largest long gun ban in Canadian history. This is a bill about handguns, it was supposed to be. And then they brought in hunting rifles, common hunting rifles and farming tools and protection against wildlife tools. It, we couldn't believe when we opened this amendment, hundreds and hundreds of pages long, lines and lines and lines of every firearm that I've ever heard of that have just been commonly used for many, many years by people. So that was G20, Amendment G20. It was a devastating day to see that. And then we had G4 as well. So if you hear me talk about G4, G20, this is what I'm talking about. G4 was even more concerning. At least G20 puts it on paper. G4 hides what they're really trying to do. G4 took all the May 2020 OIC definitions that they used to ban long guns at that time and made it any even worse by bringing forward what is effectively, I think it's fair to say, Tony, effectively uh, a semi-automatic long gun ban. There's only a handful that won't get caught up in that definition. That is a massive change in firearm ownership in this country. Massive. And to drop it at the 11th hour in the most sneaky and underhanded way possible and think that they were just going to waltz through. They thought it would take a week, a week to pass this at committee. But they've never worked with me before. So that wasn't going to happen. So we filibustered and we filibustered and we launched a public communications campaign. I put everything I had in me and I had such tremendous support from people in this room, from my conservative caucus, and of course from our leader, Pierre Polyev, who is there cheering us on and helping us carry the message every step of the way. And uh, they thought they are cocky. They thought, well, we got it in 2021. You'll remember they had the election, they had a podium like this and basically a video game looking gun with big X on it. And they messaged every day that conservatives were going to put these all on the streets or something. And it worked in 2021. It worked in 2019. So I thought, oh, we'll just sneak this in and it'll work again. Great. And we'll use it as a big wedge tool in the next election. 
but it didn't work that way. Uh, for the first time ever, they retreated and withdrew their amendment. That has never happened before. And that's from the hard work from the people in this room. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what happened this week. But first, I want to talk to you, because round two. We're at round two. So I did a little prayer when Mendocino brought forward round two on this this week and just asked God, please give me the strength to do this again. And uh, I do. I do have it in me to do this again. But I'll talk to you in a little bit about what our plan is and uh, how I'm going to keep, we're going to keep fighting in the trenches every day against this because they're just going to keep coming. That's very clear. But one thing I want to make... I want to equip you with when you're having conversations with uh, the folks in your life, if you have any who may not be as keen as you are on firearms, all people, all parties agree that we need to keep Canadians safe. I mean, that's part of the job of police and governments and, and everything like that. But what's what the reality is, is we're seeing the largest violent crime spike in generations. Since 2015, there's been a 32% increase of violent crime. So that's, we're talking rapes, assaults, stabbings, murders, things like that. Very serious crimes where someone is harmed in many cases, right? And so since 2015 to 2021 is our latest stats, and I think they're going to be even higher in 2022 based on the headlines we're seeing and what I've heard from police, there were 124,000 more annual violent crime incidents in 2021 than in 2015. That's how significant, that's how many more people have been seriously hurt more often than not from repeat violent offenders. Uh, you may have heard, is anyone from BC in here? Is anyone from, it's, I know it's a bit of a trek from here, but BC and Toronto, anyone from Toronto? Toronto area, Burlington? Yeah, okay. So we know in public transit, there's been an onslaught of violence lately. If completely innocent people, sort of those stranger attacks, people are being jumped and stabbed and pushed in front of buses and things like never before. And what's been happening is it's the same people. So recently in Surrey, BC, a man was attacked on public transit. He was stabbed, attempted murder. And that attempted murderer is back on the streets nine days later less than two weeks after trying to stab someone, just an innocent person he didn't even know, on a bus, or SkyTrain, pardon me, he's back on the streets. You think this would be a one-off, but it's not. We're seeing this consistently. And this fellow followed a death of a 17-year-old boy in BC also that was stabbed to death on a bus. Completely innocent, just out of the blue. That followed shortly after a 16-year-old boy was stabbed on a Toronto public transit station. Again, a completely unprovoked and random attack, these children, these young boys being murdered. And there's countless other examples that you've seen on TV as well. So we're facing serious issues, and there's shootings as well. For example, in Toronto last year, 44 murders by handgun or by firearm. Of that 44, 24 of the murderers were out on bail at the time that they killed those individuals. 24 people would still be alive if the bail system wasn't as weak as it is. Unbelievable. And we know as well, police officers are brave police officers that keep us safe. There's been 10 of them died this year, eight of them on the job, notably uh, Officer Greg Priscella, an OPP officer, a young guy, new on the job, walks up to a truck in the ditch, the driver shoots him dead. That driver was out on bail and had a lifetime prohibition order from owning firearms. So again, this is the problem. The people in this room know those people are the problem. Why are those people out on bail? How dare they be out on bail amongst everyday innocent Canadians? These guys, I've talked to ex-criminals who've turned their life around and help young men out of a life of crime in Toronto. You can get an illegal handgun in under two hours in Toronto because the border is so porous under Justin Trudeau. They're just flooding in from Chicago and other cities. No problem. They can go for $7,000, $10,000 a pop with these criminal drug rings. And so that's going on. Our police officers are being uh, shot and murdered. Our young, our young people riding the subway, just trying to get to school, being stabbed and murdered to death. And so we have all that happening, and it's happening more and more. The stats showing us it's getting worse and worse. So much so that the police are really trying to send a message. Actually, Victoria Police in BC recently they had to release a man who was charged with 10 counts of sexual assault with a weapon. That's rape with a weapon. Ten, ten counts. He was released back onto the street, no problem. And at the bottom, God bless the police for saying this, it says, he was released because of Bill C-75. 
Bill C-75 was a liberal bill from a few years ago that instituted catch and release bail policies, like simplified it so much that the default in essence is now for violent criminals to get bail. You have to really work to get them not to get bail. And the data shows us, again, BC, NDP government hammering on the liberals for bail, which is just great to see. There, this is the last stat I'll share with you. There were 1,325, so 1,325 violent offenders on trial last year. Prosecutors and government lawyers only asked for detention 516 times. So they asked for bail to be denied just over 500 times out of 1,300 times. Again, violent offenders. And of those 500 times that the lawyers actually did ask for bail to be denied, Judges only granted it 221 times. So of the 1,325 violent offenders on trial, only 221 of them were kept off the streets. This is the problem. This is the problem right here. So much so that every single premier in Canada, how often does Quebec and Alberta agree on anything? It's is amazing. They signed one letter and they actually just on Friday submitted another of the same letter, sent a letter to Justin Trudeau demanding bail reform. Every premier of the territories and provinces all agree demanding bail reform. They've sent two letters now. This is unprecedented from premiers. Other than this, healthcare is the only thing that they seem to negotiate together on. And so to see this is quite remarkable. And all the big city mayors in Ontario, same thing, signed a letter to the Liberal government just last year and if you talk to any municipal police force, as it is in Victoria with their news release there that I mentioned, they all agree as well. And if you talk to RCMP officers off the cuff, they'll tell you it's bail reform that we need. And so where are the liberals on this? People are actually dying from this on the streets, being stabbed and murdered. Our police officers are eight of them, preventable deaths, unbelievable. And they're, not, they're nowhere on this. They've brought forward nothing. It's been months. And more police officers and innocent Canadians have died since the premiers first sent that letter back in January. So they've made no progress on this. They've made, they say they've made a commitment to it, but I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe a tough on crime piece of legislation when I see it. I have my doubts. But then, you know, they just dropped a tw the 2023 federal budget. And as you know, when a government brings forward its budget, those are its priorities for the year. It's telling you, the taxpayer, these are the things we care about that we're going to do on your behalf. You want to know how many times violent crime and bail reform were mentioned in that budget? Zero. Zero times was violent crime or bail reform mentioned. It is not a priority for the Liberal government, and we should all be very concerned about this. Every Canadian should care about this because they're not going to do anything to fix it because they have the leftist belief that we should go soft on criminals and tough on gun owners. That is what they believe at the core. How do you fight against that? We're trying every day. And I think the public is with us. All the latest data shows that the polling, people are on our, our side, conservative side, about cleaning up our streets. Everybody wants their kids and wives and husbands to be safe when we walk to the grocery store. And so they're on our side on this. So this is what we've been talking about. When I talk about guns, I'm talking about the problem. It's the violent criminals in Toronto who are smuggling guns in from the United States. Leave law-abiding citizens alone. This is the message we're sending to Justin Trudeau every single day. So I did mention the budget, and it is their priority. So what is in the budget for guns? Well, there's $29 million, $29 million, Think of how many police officers this can hire. $29 million over five years for the IT computer program for their so-called buyback program. So this is coming, folks. May 2020 was three years ago now. It's coming. They have brought forward the tax dollars. I believe they're maybe working, I've heard with IBM, don't quote me, but they're working with a big computer company to develop a highly advanced computer system for their individual confiscation regime of your firearms. They, this is coming. I know it's been three years, but they are well on their way behind the scenes doing this. And we know that they're trying to work with police province to province. They're trying to go with financial incentives to get the police to be the ones to help with their confiscation regime. So rather than going after the gangsters and the criminals and the repeat violent offenders that are stabbing children on buses, Police are going to be busy going to your home to pick up your confiscated firearm after you've entered it in online. Can you even understand? I cannot comprehend 
what kind of government would put this kind of priority for police? And you talk to police off offside, and they like, we don't have time for this. We are barely keeping up with violent offenders, let alone petty crime. You call police for a break and enter, they're so overwhelmed with violent criminals, it is takes them weeks to figure out your break and enters. So it's very concerning in that regard. So $30 million is going to be spent of your tax dollars on the IT buyback program. And then, so I challenged the minister on this, and he says, well, Ms. Dancho, <laughs> Ms. Dancho, there are a lot of ways to fight gun violence. You know, a lot of ways. I'm like, well, the only way, the only thing that you look like you're doing is you're coming after law-abiding Canadians. He's like, well, we're going, we're investing in the border. We're investing in the border. You'll see him throw big sums of money around and on you know, national TV, a committee, hundreds of millions of dollars for the border. Well, sounds pretty good, right? We need to stop gun smuggling. He agrees. I looked really close at the budget line items and got some information about where that money's going. It's very interesting. So in 2015, when uh, the Conservatives lost to the Liberals, there were 8,400 frontline officers working on the border, right? Those are the guys and gals who would be doing the, who would be catching the gun smugglers. 8,400 on every port, every border entry. Uh, eight years later, you want to know how many there are? There are just 25 more that they've hired. And yet they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars. So where is it going? Well, I did some more digging. Middle management, there was 2,000 middle, middle managers eight years ago. I don't know how many there are now. 4,000. 4,000 middle managers. Again, all respect. If there's public servants in this room, thank you for the work you do. But if we're going to catch gun smugglers... We need frontline officers doing that work, not middle managers. And they have effectively, or they have doubled from 2,000 to 4,000 middle managers. And these are six-figure jobs, okay? So that's where the money is going. So he has no right to say that they're investing all this money in the border to stop guns. No, they're not. They're investing in middle managers, most of them located in Ottawa. And also, you'll remember in Saskatchewan, there was the third largest mass massacre in Canadian history. There was what happened in Nova Scotia, there's what happened in Polytechnic in the 1980s, and there's what happened in Saskatchewan. The Liberals didn't want to talk about this one very much. You actually might have forgotten about it, which is very sad, but uh, they barely talked about it in the news. But it was in Saskatchewan, on a First Nations, a crazed, vile man who was out on parole, even though he had 59 convictions, he slaughtered 11 people with a knife, 17 more in, um, in hospital. With a knife, though, not a firearm. That might have been why you didn't hear about it. But he was out on parole. How is it that a man, a dangerous man with violent history with 59 convictions, got out on parole? How is it that we have that, this in this country? This man should have not got out on parole. He should not have got an early release, and yet he did. And 11 people were butchered by him. And I've tried to bring this up get at committee, at public safety committee. We need to study this. We need to put a stop to whatever leaks and parole are happening. We need to plug them. Liberals don't want to study it because it's with a, with a knife, is my guess, because they're happy to talk about Nova Scotia, happy to open a mass casualty commission for that one, which is devastating, a devastating situation, Canada. But why isn't there the same push for this guy? There should be. Those 11 people deserve it. What's interesting, the Liberals have cut 12% to the parole board and this 36% decrease in staff. So again, they're saying they're spending all this money to tackle gun violence, and yet the parole board's getting a 36% cut of staff. That's how mistakes happen. And it tells you a lot about their priorities. So I just wanted to, le to let you know, when the Liberals talk about how much they're doing to fight gun violence in these other ways, not just going after the people in this room, they're not telling the truth. They're not following through on what they say. And when they do, it's just to middle management and making cuts so that Trudeau can give it to more high-priced consultants and can fly down to New York on your tax dollars and schmooze with celebrities and actors. That's what we're seeing today with the Liberals. And so we have a lot to fight for and a lot to fight against in Ottawa. Your conservative team is hard at work. And now we've got round two. So I'll finish with telling you about this week what happened. So 8.30 in the morning, Wednesday, we have our caucus meetings with Pierre Polyev and all the folks at this table. And 8.30 in the morning, Mendicino gets up and announces he's launching officially phase one of the buyback program, the confiscation regime as we know it. 
and it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars. And they're being very sneaky because they're not admitting how much it's going to cost. But tens of millions of dollars can make a huge impact at our border. Hire countless police officers to fight gangsters in Toronto and Winnipeg and London and other places. Tens of millions of dollars to go after firearms that, un that are under lock and key in gun shops. That's where this Liberal government's priorities are. And I think that they had a few motivations for this announcement too. Because they know that people in this room are united. They know that Canadians who own firearms are united. They know the advocacy groups are united. They know that we're united with Conservatives on our message. We know that we want to have dignity and respect for our law-abiding firearms owners. They don't like that very much, right? Because united is strong. So they're very sneaky with their announcement. And I do believe part of their motivation is to start dividing the gun advocacy groups. So I'd ask the people in this room, don't let that happen. Don't play their game. Let's not play into what the Liberals want. I know it can be tough, but I know for me, I'm, uh, I'm working together with everybody that I can. We need to work and be rowing all in the same direction. And it's cruel irony that the Liberal government would starve small mom and pop gun retailers of revenue and then take some taxpayer dollars uh, to try and buy them off. I understand this government has pummeled small business, not just in the firearms industry. So I understand that this situation is very sensitive and that there's a lot of sensitivity in, this, uh, in the industry about it. But what I say is don't let them divide us. We have to stay united because the fight is round two is just beginning. When he announced that, they announced new, stronger attacks on Pierre Polyev, the people in this room, in the Conservative caucus. They are, they've come back swinging and swinging hard. So we have to put our, I, I call my lipstick my war paint. Got to put my war paint on, got to put the armor on, and we're going back into the House of Commons and in committee to fight them, round two. Because they've, they have strategized, they have test grouped and focus grouped their messaging, and they are ready to take this on again. Uh, but we're not going to let them. They've talked about that they're very much getting ready for the confiscation regime of your firearms. That is coming. As I mentioned, the IT program is almost ready to go, it sounds like. So we are fighting this tooth and nail. Pierre Polyev is one of the strongest voices, I would say, in this country. He's a gifted communicator, and he's the hardest working person that I've ever met. And it's quite inspiring to be under the leadership of a hardworking man like that. I have to say I've had a number of leaders, and they all have their own great attributes, and it's great to have strong leadership from the Conservative Party. But I was asked by um, some school's kids I was speaking to, you know, what's it like with Pierre Polyev? And I said, how do I explain this to a kid? So I thought... You know when you have a hockey team and maybe you're the captain, it's not very good, maybe doesn't practice very hard, makes everyone else take the hits, kind of a toxic person. It's not so fun going to hockey practice. But when you have a hockey captain who's out at the front of the line, taking the hits, taking the bold moves, working harder than everyone, inspiring you in the locker room, that's when you start winning gold. That's when you start sco scoring goals every single day. That's when that exhaustion, you don't really feel it because you're so motivated by your captain. That's kind of what it's like with Pierre Polyev. It's, uh, he's a once in a generation kind of leader, folks. And uh, he's had my back the whole way with our firearms approach. And uh, we meet all the time to talk about it. It is a priority for him. Fighting violent crime and ensuring respect for law-abiding firearms owners is a top priority. You'll see he talks about the economy and crime. And in crime is ensuring that you are respect and that you get to keep your firearms, that people like us get to keep our way of life. And uh, as I shared with you at the beginning, it is a deep, deep motivation for me going back four generations of proud Canadians. And so I'm going to keep fighting for this. And I know the Conservatives in this room are going to do the same. And I thank you very much for coming out to support the CSSA. Thank you again to the CSSA for all that you've done to help, uh, to help me learn a little bit more about the technical side of firearms, not just to point and shoot the technical side. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will say that uh, you can rest assured that conservatives are going to keep fighting for you every single day. No matter how hard liberals come at us, we will always get back up and we're going to keep leading the charge to fight for you in Ottawa. All right. Thank you very much.